Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted that we have Peter Berry here with us today uh, for the second keynote address. Uh, Dr. Berry is Senior Policy Health Advisor at Health Canada's Climate Change and Health Office in Ottawa, where he has conducted research on health risks of climate change to Canadians, adaptive capacity, health vulnerability assessment, and communicating climate change risks to the public. Uh, by the way, you, these bios are in your program, so that uh, if you want to either follow along or to find uh, uh, these people afterward, um, the information is in the back of the program. So Peter is the co-author of a number of Health Canada documents related to climate change and health, including chapters in a report called Human Health in a Changing Climate, a Canadian Assessment of Vulnerabilities and Adaptive Capacities, which was released in 2008. Uh, currently, he's co-authoring publications to help Canadians prepare for more extreme heat events, including one called Communicating the Health Risks of Extreme Heat Events, uh, colon, Toolkit for Public Health and Emergency Management Officials, and another one called Assessment of Vulnerability to the Health Impacts of Extreme Heat in Winnipeg. Uh, Peter's been actively involved in a number of collaborations that are related to preparing for the health impacts of climate change. Uh, he's co-chair of the Expert Advisory Group for Development of Health Canada's Guidelines for Assessing Human Health Vulnerabilities to Extreme Heat Events and he's a member of an international group for development of PAHO and WHO guidelines for assessing human health vulnerabilities to climate change. And he's a past member of the advisory committee for the Climate Change Impacts and Adaptations Initiative under the Climate Pros Prosperity? Prosperity Program of the National Roundtable on Environment and the Economy. Okay, at some point you must explain to us what the Climate Prosperity Program is because it's an intriguing name. That, yeah, I'll, so, uh, uh, I'll try and do that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks very much to, uh, to Gloria and to uh, Simon Fraser University for the invitation to participate uh, in this uh, conference. and. Uh, Send regards um, from our manager, Jim Fraze, uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure to come to uh, Vancouver and uh, see and learn from uh, a number of uh, different experts. Um, coming uh, from, from Ottawa, it's a, a long way to come to uh, finally see a, a winning Canadian hockey team. Uh, but, 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 but I can't go to Toronto uh, for, for that for, for a very long time. But. So, um, so I'm really excited to be here today. Um, Given the importance, I think, of the conference in uh, really kind of scoping out a, a new line of inquiry with respect to uh, climate change and health, um, it wasn't uh, too long ago that um, uh, the the knowledge about climate change and health risks uh, was really in its uh, infancy, um, and uh, only about uh, you know eight or nine or ten years ago, and in fact that this wasn't really on the radar screen of uh, public health officials. But um, I think really thanks to uh, uh, the uh, efforts of, of the WHO and uh, PAHO uh, in uh, raising awareness uh, of this uh, issue. And um, I think the efforts of the Public Health Agency of Canada with respect to um, helping seniors prepare for extreme weather events, um, that we're really in a good position to uh, start uh, tackling some of the um, uh, climate change issues that uh, potentially could, uh, could affect seniors. So um, it's really my, uh, my contention uh, today that there's, there's, I think, a fundamental question that uh, uh, needs to be addressed in terms of um, uh, the, the conference and what we're here at. Uh, in particular, I think, you know, we need to think about um, how do we need to build on current efforts to ensure our health and social services, emergency uh, management uh, uh, systems, and communities more generally are supportive of the needs and the aspirations of uh, healthy seniors. 
so I guess in a nutshell, what does climate change mean that we actually need to do uh, differently uh, to a lot of the things that, uh, that we're already doing to, to support uh, uh, some of the, the, the um, healthy environments uh, for seniors? So I think to, to open up some of the discussion uh, in that regard, what, uh, what I'll do is provide a bit of an overview in terms of climate change impacts on, uh, on health, uh, some of the potential risks and vulnerabilities uh, for seniors. But I also want to highlight uh, some of the growing knowledge and tools uh, to address the impacts that, uh, uh, that have um, uh, developed over the last few years. We have made progress in the public health field, I think, um, and, uh, and we should uh, acknowledge that. Then what I'll do is I'll highlight just a, a few ways that um, I think that uh, climate change requires us to think and act differently uh, about our efforts to address health risks to seniors, uh, sort of so-called uh, um, uh, age-friendly uh, adaptation. So we're all uh, uh, well aware of this. Um, the impacts of climate change are already with us and evident in Canada and around the world. This is a map uh, taken from the um, uh, National Assessment uh, from Natural Resources Canada that was released in 2008. And um, a number of you will recognize some of these impacts in terms of permafrost degradation in Canada's north, uh, increased uh, coastal erosion, reduced uh, glacier cover, uh, lower lake and river levels, uh, reduced snow cover, uh, and I could uh, go on and on. Um, I think what's really important from a health perspective is that these uh, impacts on our environment uh, and uh, uh, sort of ecological resources are all happening at once. Um, and uh, they're putting pressures uh, on uh, these systems that uh, ultimately support health. So what happens is uh, uh, climate change impacts um, uh, the uh, risks that uh, uh, come out of this in terms of affecting uh, the health of, uh, of people. So we... Um, I'm supposed to have another couple of boxes here. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, so we're concerned about extreme weather events, uh, as has been uh, mentioned uh, already. Uh, but we're also concerned about uh, gradual warming uh, of the environment because uh, both of those together affect uh, the natural environment, the built environment, and, uh, and the social environment. And I think what's really, really critical from, uh, from a public health perspective and from an adaptation perspective is the impacts that uh, this has on the determinants of health, which are so, uh, so important uh, uh, for, uh, for healthy living. So, for example, uh, personal health practices, employment and working conditions, health and social services, uh, social networks, and even cultures, uh, for example, impacts in Canada's north uh, uh, that we're seeing, uh, we're really observing major, major impacts uh, on cultures. And these are very uh, complex, um, uh, I think, uh, impacts that we need to be concerned about. So this is one example of an impact that uh, was documented in our health assessment in 2008. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we had a chapter in the assessment on um, uh, threats from increased infectious diseases due to uh, climate change. Um, and these uh, figures show um, the uh, projection in the spread of the uh, tick that causes um, uh, Lyme disease, uh, in, um, uh, particularly in, uh, for here in eastern Canada. Um, and uh, basically from uh, the 1991 uh, to 2000 time frame to the 2020s. And you, you see that uh, there is a, a projection uh, in terms of an increase in intensity. Um, my understanding is we are actually seeing these uh, tick uh, populations uh, in southern Canada. It's a very nasty, uh, nasty disease. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so this is, this is a really uh, important thing. The Public Health Agency of Canada is currently, um, they've got an initiative to prepare uh, communities uh, for increased risk from infectious diseases, and I think they're actually updating some of these, uh, these models and these projections. So it's uh, quite an important area. And another, uh, I think, uh, expected impact on health, which is probably more visible to people, arises from more frequent and uh, severe uh, weather disasters. And in fact, we are, uh, as has been mentioned already, we're seeing this uh, uh, in Canada, but uh, also internationally. So this uh, chart from the World Health Organization shows the uh, uh, increase from two different uh, time periods in uh, the number of uh, uh, droughts, uh, extreme temperature events, uh, storms, and floods. And um, I guess what, what uh, I think for me is really important to highlight here is these uh, events can have absolutely catastrophic impacts on uh, developing countries um, and uh, presumably on older populations in, in uh, these developing countries. Um, on the news a couple of uh, nights ago, I was, uh, um, caught the last bit of a documentary that was uh, looking back at the, the flooding in um, uh, Pakistan that uh, Carlos had highlighted. Uh, seven months after the floods, there's parts of the country that are still underwater. 
Um, there's uh, something like three million people that are still receiving uh, food aid uh, in tents. I mean, just absolutely to catastrophic uh, impacts. But I think the other thing that's really important is, uh, and I think we've learned this over the last five or six years, developed countries uh, too can be vulnerable to, to some of these very severe impacts. Um, the European heat wave in 2003 has been mentioned and the Russian heat wave in, in 2010. And I think we really need to, uh, need to keep that in mind. And so as climate change becomes more rapid and, uh, and the impacts become much more evident, I think there's a growing recognition that everybody is, uh, to one degree or another, climate sensitive. And uh, so by that I mean that uh, even minor uh, changes in uh, some of these climate variabilities, such as sea level, um, uh, air temperature, ocean temperature, ice cover, glacier thickness, and others, can really create conditions such as uh, natural disasters that really impact uh, health very, very severely. And I think to some degree, a number of us uh, uh, in our lives are probably going to be uh, affected uh, by climate change, either indirectly uh, or directly. Uh, these pe uh, pictures actually show um, damages that occurred uh, around my house um, in mid-May. And my understanding is these are the remnants of the storms that came up from uh, the U.S. that killed so many people uh, with the tornadoes. Um, so you see on the left-hand side, this is um, uh, a highway sign not far from my house that uh, there was three big steel, uh, uh, very thick posts, and the signs were just flipped over by the wind. Uh, this is a fence right to uh, um, our neighbor's fence, and these two huge trees in a park about two blocks uh, up um, from, from where I live were just snapped in half by the wind. Now, very fortunately, this is pretty minor damage compared to um, you know, what's been happening, and people have probably heard on the, no uh, the news uh, the two recent tornadoes uh, in the U.S., uh, but, uh, but this stuff can hit uh, pretty close to home, I think. However, we do know that uh, some populations are at significantly higher risk uh, to health impacts because of multiple sensitivities um, or barriers to adaptation. Um, and so this chart is actually taken from uh, the results from our uh, vulnerability assessment. Um, and you see why I think we need to be concerned about uh, some of the potential impacts uh, on, uh, on older, uh, older adults. Um, you see that they are at increased uh, physiological sensitivity to um, basically all of the uh, climate change uh, health impacts that we're really concerned about. So uh, temperature-related morbidity and mortality that's been talked about uh, uh, quite a bit, but also health effects from other extreme weather events. Uh, air pollution, uh, a big, big issue for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, seniors. Uh, health effects of water and foodborne contamination, uh, that, um, and this is expected to um, uh, increase uh, some of the risk to health because of climate change. And vector-borne and zoonotic uh, diseases. And not only does climate change threaten the health uh, of uh, older adults because of a range of separate uh, health issues, uh, but in some cases there's a number of factors that may combine to uh, really increase uh, risk from specific uh, hazards. And I think uh, uh, Tom Kozatsky uh, covered this quite well in his talk in terms of uh, the risk factors uh, for um, uh, uh, morbidity and mortality from extreme heat. Um, but I've, I've got a number of them here in terms of pre-existing disease, um, social factors such as living alone, taking certain drugs, medications, impaired cognition, and others. And what we uh, can see is that uh, a number of these can be more prevalent in uh, um, uh, older people, or uh, you can get a number of these factors uh, combining in, uh, in uh, this population group. Uh, and in Canada, and I know this has been uh, covered, we do have um, um, a rapid uh, aging of the population, so uh, something to, uh, to keep in mind. But of course we have to remember that, um, uh, and in fact in experience from uh, past uh, natural disasters teaches us uh, that many seniors are actually quite resilient to climate change impacts. Uh, so in particular, uh, you know, many Canadians uh, enjoy good health and active lifestyles, uh, Canadian seniors, and, and in fact um, you know, this is recognized internationally as being one of the key things that makes, uh, makes you resilient to these impacts. Uh, many have life experiences and knowledge that make them more resilient, um, and we really found this out during the Quebec ice storm. Uh, through some of the uh, the stories about uh, who and who wasn't uh, uh, resilient, uh, uh, which is important. Uh, many form the uh, core of uh, volunteer groups and communities that are critical during emergencies and disasters. And uh, many older people serve as models of resilience and resourcefulness uh, to other community members. So, you know, I think uh, seniors are going to make a major contribution to building the resilience of uh, communities uh, and um, uh, uh, other uh, seniors in, in their communities. 
Now, I think to address potential vulnerabilities that may exist and to really uh, provide supporting environments uh, for uh, older people, to increase their resiliency in that of communities in the face of climate change, we really have to make sure that our communities are prepared for some of these impacts. Um, and again, to go back to the uh, European heat wave in 2003 and uh, even the, uh, the, the Russian heat, heat wave, I think these are really stark reminders that uh, you can have very uh, catastrophic impacts if you're not prepared, if the communities are not prepared uh, for some of these, uh, these hazards. So very, very important. And in this regard, I think we really have to consider and address the various ways that healthcare institutions uh, can be vulnerable to climate change impacts. So, for example, damage to health infrastructures such as hospitals and clinics and nursing homes. And um, again, on the on the news a few nights ago, the, uh, there was a, a reporting on the uh, tornado that went through uh, Missouri, and um, they were showing pictures of a, a hospital, St. John's Hospital, that was totally uh, destroyed. It was quite just uh, really quite awful. Um, and so they were scrambling to try and, you know, get all of the patients out of there and, and move them to another uh, hospital. So that, that can be uh, quite devastating. Uh, but uh, in terms of inadequately trained personnel or lack of an emergency uh, plan, quite, uh, quite important. Um, uh, the, just the loss of uh, services uh, during emergencies, uh, overcrowding in emergency sh uh, shelters, and even something like losing electronic uh, medical records uh, when power goes out. So there's a number of different uh, ways that... Uh, um, healthcare institutions uh, can be uh, vulnerable and can be impacted by some of these events uh, that, that needs to be really planned for. Well, I think that the, the good news is that uh, we've had a real explosion in uh, knowledge about climate change and health impacts in, in just the last uh, number of years. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, we can really use this information to inform uh, adaptation. Um, and, uh, and so I've, I've listed uh, a number of uh, reports that uh, have been released uh, uh, by uh, the WHO, the, the U.S., uh, European Environment Agency, for example. And this really isn't even up to date. And, you know, really look at the, the date, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the actual dates of this, 2008, 2009. There's a lot of information coming out, which I think is a really positive and, and, and good thing. And, you know, just to point out the um, Growing Old and the Changing Climate uh, report, and I think we're uh, lucky enough to have the author speaking tomorrow about this. Uh, so we've actually got some information right on, um, uh, on seniors and climate change, which is uh, good. And, and this knowledge, I think, has turned uh, into, sorry, has in turn led to the development of new tools that decision makers can actually use to, uh, to try and protect uh, health. There's a lot of interest in com Canadian communities on uh, mapping vulnerabilities and using GIS technologies to, uh, to actually do that. This is an example of um, a map that was developed uh, by Luke Viscovi uh, in Montreal, and it shows, uh, basically it overlays uh, uh, extreme heat and um, an index of um, a vulnerability based on um, you know, poverty, uh, age, education, and social isolation. And um, uh, I've got a bit of a typo up there. But really what this is used for is public health officials that um, uh, need to uh, really target, because they don't have the resources, they need to target where the people are that really provide the assistance. Uh, of course, not, uh, not all uh, seniors require assistance, but those with the chronic diseases and, and, and such... Um, they, can, uh, they can target them most uh, efficiently using these tools. And I think, uh, you know, the, the other good news is that public health authorities within and outside of Canada are taking important uh, measures and actions to address some of these health risks uh, right now. Um, and uh, this is actually uh, from some notes that I took at um, uh, a meeting that um, uh, Carlos organized in uh, Costa Rica uh, last summer where a number of uh, countries were brought together to share their experiences uh, with respect to uh, their actions on climate change and health. And you see the range of different uh, things that are, uh, that are being done, uh, which I think, again, is uh, very, very positive in terms of developing strategies for adaptation, doing uh, risk assessments, uh, surveying healthcare workers, um, uh, again, using uh, GIS to, to really map vulnerabilities. This is all very, very positive. And I think something that's uh, really important in, in terms of this conference is, you know, a lot of the information and, uh, and possibly the future collaborations that uh, come out of this conference, uh, I think should be used to really inform some of these activities that are going on and to kind of inject that, uh, that information about um, uh, how, uh, you know, environments that uh, seniors live in can be improved so that uh, uh, they're uh, more resilient. So we know that climate change is having impacts that's affecting health. Uh, we know that uh, uh, some seniors may be uh, uh, more at uh, risk to, to the impacts and that we have new knowledge and new tools to take some of the actions. 
So what then does this mean for our collective efforts to, uh, to prepare? And I really think that we, um, uh, to be successful, we've got to um, answer uh, these five questions. So the first is one information not merely informs, but actually changes behavior. I think that's absolutely critical. And, and, and this has come out, I think, in a number of the presentations that uh, people have made about the effectiveness of what we do. Um, and so, so really critical. How do you mainstream adaptation? Uh, so how, how do you acquire information about implications of future climate? How do you consider climate and routine uh, risk assessments? and institutionalize climate considerations into assessments and planning. The third one that I think is really critical is uh, what is adaptation? Um, what do we need to do to adapt? Is it a new activity? Uh, for example, a new heat alert and response system. Is it a better activity, public outreach, or just avoiding sort of the maladaptation? Uh, or is it more activities, expanded surveillance? And I mean, you might, you might look at that and think, well, it's, you know, we're just talking about semantics. But when we go to communities and talk to public health uh, officials and we bring all these risk maps, um, oftentimes they'll come back to us and say, well, we're doing some of these things. What, what, you know, what is it that you mean that we have to adapt? And so I think we have to be clear about uh, what it is that uh, needs to be done on top of what we're doing or what we need to, uh, what we need to change. Also, I think what's important is how do you take a multi-sectoral uh, or multi-jurisdictional approach? How can we work together most effectively to, to address some of these issues? And what are the costs of adapting and what are the costs of not adapting? I think that's uh, really quite important. So what I'm going to do for the uh, remainder of my presentation is really um, take a look at the first two um, uh, items up there and, and try and um, illustrate how we might begin thinking about moving uh, forward with uh, age-friendly adaptations using some examples uh, of those first two. So individuals, I think, have a primary role in adaptation. And, and in fact, though, we know that um, uh, many do not take needed adaptation uh, actions to protect themselves uh, from climate hazards. Um, so for example, there have been some studies that have uh, shown that uh, uh, when people hear heat alerts, um, in fact, they don't uh, take some of the actions that uh, uh, they're supposed to to, uh, to protect themselves. Um, I think this is really community specific. Uh, some communities are farther ahead than others in terms of uh, uh, putting out awareness about uh, the alerts and the importance of, of acting. Um, so we need a bit more research. But uh, you know, Scott Sheridan from I think Kent State University, he surveyed 908 U.S. and Canadian residents. And, and the, what he found in uh, this particular study was the awareness was quite high, that the message was getting out there, which is a great thing, but only 46% of the people uh, actually changed their behavior. And in another study down here, uh, Colstein and Sheridan, um, there was, again, there was a 93% uh, of seniors, in this case, recalled during a heat warning, but less than half actually changed their, uh, their behaviors. So this is a quite important um, kind of uh, knowledge base to have. And so I think, you know, perceptions of risks are, are really quite an uh, important determinant of behavior. And uh, these results are from a, a 2006 um, uh, survey from uh, Enveronix uh, uh, here in Canada. Uh, and they surveyed Canadians uh, about uh, climate change, uh, about perceptions of health risks from climate change. So not just heat, but from climate change. And what they found was, uh, with respect to seniors, they were least likely to be able to uh, name at least one climate change risk to health. Uh, or, or to think that uh, climate change poses uh, health risks today, uh, less likely to think that either they or their community is vulnerable to climate change or to name seniors as a population that might be susceptible to health risks of climate change. I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, so less likely to actually name uh, uh, seniors as being uh, susceptible uh, and least likely to feel that a community health risks are associated with extreme weather. But what was very interesting was they found that, in fact, um, they are most, uh, the most likely to report having a household emergency kit or to regularly check for extreme weather information. Uh, so so I, I think we do need uh, more study about this. Um, uh, but, but, but I think you know, having this information is really uh, important in terms of our actions um, on, uh, on preparing uh, uh, people for climate change. And uh, health communications literature uh, shows us that perceptions of risk um, uh, that are maybe a disincentive to action are really compounded when there's barriers to adaptation uh, that are in existence. And this chart is from Health Canada's uh, recently um, uh, released uh, Heat Health Communications Toolkit for public health officials um, to communicate uh, with the public. And it shows examples of challenges seniors face in adapting to uh, extreme heat events. Um, and, and so you, you see them sort of listed there. Things like uh, uh, agility and mobility challenges, uh, visual or cognitive and uh, maybe hearing impairments. In terms of hearing uh, alerts, 
uh, for example. Uh, possibly uh, uh, some parts of the population may have re reduced uh, literacy. And I think uh, Tom had mentioned uh, the possible issue of social isolation being very, very important. Well, to uh, try and address uh, these challenges, Health Canada has incorporated some of these considerations uh, into our new Extreme Heat and Health Information brochure uh, for, uh, for seniors. And th this is really meant to uh, raise awareness of what some of the health risks are um, and, and also to uh, provide some direction in terms of how uh, uh, they can protect themselves and their family members uh, when you have uh, these very, very hot conditions. And so what, uh, what we did was we made sure that our messages are science-based um, there were, and I think probably still are, some messages that aren't necessarily supported by uh, the science in terms of uh, do you use a fan when it's uh, very, very hot, um, or um, uh, lots of different uh, examples uh, like that. One thing that was really important is uh, making sure that the font is uh, large and easy to read and that the uh, messages are tailored to seniors. So uh, making sure that we have information on the use of medications, for example, um, and the importance of uh, speaking to your doctor uh, about whether or not the medications that you're taking might predispose you to uh, uh, heat illness. And uh, uh, making sure that we included uh, pow uh, positive and empowering messages and, uh, and images uh, was considered to be quite important. Now, the other adaptation requirement that um, I'll use to discuss um, uh, sort of adaptation measures is the need to mainstream climate change adaptation into existing programs and processes. Now, a lot in the climate change literature has been discussed, literature has been discussed about you know, making sure you mainstream climate change into your programs. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of specific direction about how to do that for decision makers. Um, so it's usually this, this broad uh, blank uh, statement, and, uh, w which makes it quite, uh, quite difficult. Um, I think that one uh, major requirement for mainstreaming is, is to first identify what your climate-sensitive uh, policies and programs uh, are, um, and, and that may need to be altered because of the increased uh, risks or the increased exposures that climate change is uh, presenting. And I think there's a range of these um, uh, possible uh, uh, programs. Um, we're really fortunate um, uh, at the federal level to have the Division of Aging and Seniors in the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, that can coordinate um, uh, some of these, uh, these issues. But there's, there's a, a number of other uh, programs. So, for example, food safety um, uh, is quite important. Infectious disease uh, management, uh, uh, mental health, as uh, uh, some of these issues may, uh, uh, may affect uh, older adults. Uh, the health of northern populations, travel medicine, um, uh, many seniors travel. Uh, what happens if we see um, more malaria in uh, areas where people are traveling to? Uh, you know, very, very important. That was actually um, uh, identified in our vulnerability assessment as being a possible increased uh, risk. risk. Um, air and water quality, uh, emergency preparedness has been talked a lot about um, at the conference. Uh, occupational health, uh, when you've got extreme heat events uh, and people are working in uh, bakeries and things like that, uh, uh, quite important. Uh, Children's environmental health, uh, uh, healthcare system capacity is quite important. Uh, if uh, the health systems are impacted by some of these extreme weather events, uh, will they have the, um, uh, will they be able to meet some of the needs of uh, older adults uh, when they require the services and such? And even indirectly, uh, possibly sustainable development. But we also need to take climate change into account when we uh, conduct routine population health uh, assessment activities. And this is another way of uh, mainstreaming. And this figure actually shows the uh, steps developed by Health Canada for assessing vulnerability to uh, uh, extreme heat. Uh, so you've got a uh, you know, number of steps for initiating the assessment, uh, describing current vulnerability. And it's in this step where uh, uh, public health authorities can really uh, characterize some of the individual characteristics um, that can increase um, uh, people's susceptibility to uh, heat uh, illness and, uh, and uh, death. Um, uh, we also uh, then assess future uh, risks through uh, modeling, um, uh, identify adaptation options, examine measures in other sectors, so assess how um, transportation policies and these types of things might impact some of the, uh, the, the risks, and develop performance uh, protocols to really be able to evaluate uh, some of the adaptation options that... Uh, uh, that are developed. We're actually using the uh, steps to do um, uh, uh, three vulnerability assessments in uh, Canadian communities and learning quite a bit about, um, uh, about the, the process for doing this, about engaging people in communities in terms of the capacities that, uh, that are needed. Uh, we've held workshops in the three uh, different uh, communities um, with uh, different uh, population groups and it's really, really quite important. 
And I think uh, you know another example of mainstreaming uh, climate change into uh, public health uh, adaptations is the, uh, the Ontario Public Health Standards, which actually, um, uh, and this was uh, uh, the, the 2008 version, actually integrates requirements right into it um, in terms of uh, climate change. So, for example, uh, uh, the requirement is to increase public awareness of health risk factors associated with climate change and to develop and implement healthy policies related to uh, climate change. And I understand uh, from some of the discussions um, <clears throat> uh, yesterday that um, the uh, BC adaptation strategy also supports uh, mainstreaming um, by requiring all ministries uh, to integrate climate change considerations into some of their activities, which I think is a great thing. And mainstreaming also requires public health officials to integrate climate change impacts uh, into existing operational plans. So the, the Assiniboine Health uh, Regional Authority in Manitoba, this is one of the um, uh, communities that uh, we've helped develop a heat alert and response system as part of our broader heat initiative. And um, what they've done is as part of their, um, uh, the development of their uh, heat alert uh, system, they developed a, a se separate emergency preparedness sheet, uh, which you see here on what public health officials and emergency management officials need to do uh, during a heat alert, and they integrated it right into their um, uh, regional action plan for emergencies. Basically, it's a binder, uh, and they, they developed this uh, a sheet on protocols for what exactly needs to happen, and they put it right in. Um, and I think this is a great example of sort of uh, a kind of mainstreaming climate change into what you're doing. And they're also, though, uh, undertaking a number of other measures tailored to meet the needs of seniors. So, for example, uh, something as simple as establishing uh, alternate meal plans in uh, uh, long-term care facilities during um, uh, hot days, uh, cold plates instead of uh, hot plates. Um, they're ensuring that uh, long-term care facilities have, uh, have a, a cooling room, uh, um, uh, a common cooling room for people, like very, very simple things. Um, and they're also uh, making sure that transportation service providers are notified during heat alerts in case people need to be transported to, uh, to cooling facilities. So a lot of really innovative things uh, coming from some of these uh, pilots and, and sort of this real mainstreaming um, uh, happening. Well, just to uh, conclude my presentation, I just wanted to um, uh, provide a couple slides on what uh, Health Canada is actually doing, or I'll get into a lot of trouble for my manager. So. Um, in terms of addressing some of these climate change um, uh, health risks. Um, you should know that there's actually, at the federal level, there's three uh, key areas of activity on climate change and health. Uh, one is our office that's looking at um, extreme uh, heat and uh, trying to prepare and uh, help Canadians prepare for some of the, uh, the risks that we're seeing, the increased heat events. Uh, I think I mentioned the Public Health Agency of Canada is looking at infectious diseases, uh, but also the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch at uh, Health Canada is um, providing um, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, funding to northern communities to try and prepare people for um, Aboriginal groups uh, for some of the health risks that uh, they're already seeing uh, in the north in terms of uh, uh, some of the food security issues with uh, things like the caribou um, uh, you know, disappearing in some areas and uh, uh, some of the water um, uh, uh, ponds and things like that drying up, which are really, really important to, to them. So, but in terms of the extreme uh, heat um, initiative that we've got, um, so we're really trying to build that capacity in communities to address some of these uh, risks. And um, one of the things that uh, I mentioned that we're doing is the health messaging, uh, really trying to identify which messages are uh, quite effective in changing individual behaviors. Um, and I think Anastasia is going to be discussing this a bit uh, more in depth tomorrow in terms of some of the uh, things that we've uh, developed. Uh, Anastasia Rogeva from, uh, from Health Canada, from our office. We're also uh, trying to address um, um, some of the science gaps, the critical knowledge gaps on heat health science. Uh, I think uh, Tom actually um, uh, spoke to some of those in his uh, presentation. But also um, uh, trying to prepare uh, some healthcare providers in terms of how do you diagnose and treat um, uh, heat-related illness. So if you have a, a Meals on Wheels person going into uh, um, uh, to a particular um, uh, uh, home, do, do they have the knowledge to be able to know if somebody uh, requires uh, some assistance because of uh, very hot days? Uh, it's a big need, um, uh, at least in Canada right now. Um, and uh, as I, I think I mentioned, uh, we've actually got uh, four communities that have developed uh, right from the ground up uh, new uh, heat alert and response systems because we really wanted to learn from them uh, what are the best practices for doing that so that we could share that with other communities in Canada. Um, and, and that was a real, uh, real success, I think. 
And so uh, what we're taking from uh, a lot of the learnings from our uh, local partners and from our provincial partners and from uh, a number of the, uh, the groups that, uh, that we've dealt with, uh, literacy groups and, uh, and such, uh, we're, we're developing uh, these, these uh, documents, uh, a best practices guide for developing heat alert and response systems. Um, I kind of uh, referred to this or uh, provided that, uh, that figure. Developing a, a guide for communities to use to actually uh, assess vulnerability um, uh, to extreme heat uh, so that they know how they can uh, target certain areas and um, uh, provide some of the assistance that might be uh, needed. Um, uh, also, we're developing healthcare worker guidelines for uh, diagnosing and treating heat illnesses. And we have released, uh, although uh, we didn't receive our box in the mail, so we don't have them here, unfortunately, um, but you can um, uh, send Anastasia or I uh, an email, our heat health communications uh, toolkit and uh, brochures. Uh, so we're really uh, quite excited about that. So just, um, uh, I guess, uh, for a final thought, just to um, uh, change gears um, uh, quite a bit, um, this is one of my favorite pictures of my uh, uh, children, uh, Stephen and, and uh, Linda. Um, this is from a few years ago. Stephen doesn't play the violin. He did that day, um, uh, but he doesn't actually play the, uh, the violin. Um, but uh, but I, I, just, I love the picture. But um, I, I've learned a couple of really important things uh, from my, my children about climate change. Um, and the one thing that I learned is it's kind of this, this thing that kind of hits you, is that uh, impacts are coming very, very quickly. Um, really quite quickly, and, and it really dawned on me how quickly they were coming when I, I considered that uh, um, by the time, uh, well, the children that are the age of, of my kids won't even be seniors by the time we have some of the very severe impacts upon us uh, in terms of, uh, there's some projections that, you know, the heat wave uh, that affected uh, Europe in 2003 will become a very common thing by the mid-century. Our children won't be, you know, I mean, th this is happening very, very quickly. The, the other thing that, um, uh, that I, I've, I've learned is that we should be optimistic about our, our um, uh, ability to really prepare for some of these um, uh, impacts, to, to work with um, um, uh, other people and uh, other jurisdictions to, to, to prepare as well. And, and it really came to me when uh, I was walking uh, my daughter to school and holding her hand, and um, she, uh, I, I don't talk to my daughter about, um, you know, uh, climate change issues at all. Uh, but she, she all of a sudden on the way to school looked up at me and said, uh, uh, it works like this. Every time there's air pollution, the trees breathe it in and, and make oxygen. If you cut down the trees, it gets warmer around the world. So we shouldn't cut down the trees, Daddy. And I thought, you know, it took me 10 years in uh, Health Canada to figure that out. And she's in grade two. And, and, and that, that's pretty darn good. So, you know, I think collaboratively we can uh, really make a difference to, um, uh, to, to move forward with uh, some, of these, uh, some of these very, very important issues. Um, and again, I just want to congratulate Gloria and uh, SFU for uh, uh, really taking a leadership role and bringing everybody together uh, in that regard. So uh, thank you very much. questions or comments that you would like to direct to Peter. John. Thank you, Thank you, Peter, and I do like your ruses. Um, this is maybe unfair to you, but it's, it's a very practical question. Do you know whether municipalities as the one that you and I live in? can take full advantage of all these studies and all the experience that we've got to put in place, or already put in place, systems and importantly accountabilities that will inform people when an alert is occurring, will inform people of what they should do, will know where there are vulnerable citizens, will have systems to transport them to places where they can be safer and less vulnerable. Uh, it, 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 does that exist? Is that in place? Can I rest assured that sure. um, my, 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 my neighbors yes. will get looked after? Yes. Uh, I think there's five mm -hmm. yeses there. Um, the, the reason I say that, uh, John, is um, 
When, when we embarked on this heat initiative uh, four years ago, um, we, we didn't just sort of start at ground zero. What we actually found was that there's a number of communities in Canada that had already developed s some kind of heat alert and response systems. So for example, in, in Ottawa, uh, one of the things that they do is they actually, when, when it's very, very hot out, they actually um, they contact the hospitals and find out if the hospitals are experiencing any more um, illnesses uh, related to, to heat. They're doing a lot of this stuff. A number of communities are doing a lot of this stuff. What we found was they were coming to us saying, what is effective? You know, what, show us what, what really is effective. Show us what uh, we, need a, we need a mechanism so that we can see what other people are, are doing, other communities are doing, and we can learn from them. So, we, so we've, you know, we've developed some of our products uh, from um, reviewing the literature, reviewing some of the great stuff that's come out of uh, um, the European experience, international experience. Um, and, and, and I think, and there's been a lot of demand for, uh, for example, our toolkit because uh, communications um, uh, was deemed by a lot of the public health people as being extremely important. We weren't going to develop a, a heat health communications toolkit, but halfway through our initiative, they, they were saying, this is just too important. We don't have the information to know how to do this uh, uh, correctly. Um, and in, I mean, in terms of uh, the you know, making sure that the communications, I think you started your question uh, with that, to get people to change their behavior. One thing that we do know is that uh, um, there's a lot of contradictory messages out there right now between, you know, heat messages and air pollution, uh, even Lyme disease in terms of when to go outside, when to stay in your house. And so even at the level of just trying to, trying to sort of um, address some of those problems that we know exist right now, um, you know, that, that's part of the way that we're, we're moving forward to, uh, to try and um, uh, help some of these communities. Yeah, that was really interesting, and uh, thank you for that. I was uh, curious about your mention of Meals of, on Wheels uh, personnel, and I wondered if you could um, expand on that a little bit. Um, I, it does seem that, uh, you know, it's, it's a reasonable... Uh, service to consider uh, the Meals on Wheels would be going to people that are uh, debilitated to the extent that they would need meals. They, there will be a considerable overlap in that population that also needs support during extreme weather events. Uh, but have you explored that in terms of uh, what additional training might be needed for them? Uh, community health workers are used in some communities uh, to do similar type services. Is this something that we could ever expect um, a provincial health authority to fund? Well, um, uh, yeah. What we've done is um, we, we're, we are developing this document um, in terms of helping um, uh, healthcare workers. And so when we said healthcare workers, we, we don't just mean doctors and nurses. These are the types of social service uh, people that, that we mean uh, to, to really diagnose uh, and be able to know what to do. Um, and, and what we did was we went out to a number of the groups that represent these people and said, you know, what would be, um, how does one go about developing this and what would be really useful? Um, in terms of uh, in terms of a document, and is it needed? I mean, you know, if do, do people already know uh, people that are going into some of these uh, the homes, long long term care uh, uh, nurses and things like? Do they already know how to uh, to do this? And you know, the, the answers were no, they don't. Th this information would be very very useful. Um, and we got a lot of good advice about um, how to package this and what exactly is the information that would be needed. So we developed sort of a, an advisory committee of users to to go ahead and do that. So we're going to be um, making that um, available um, quite quite broadly, and uh, one of the things um, that uh, that we're doing is um, there's, there's a larger document for people that um, uh, I guess you know for managers that can train people that can inform themselves about this a more technical document, but also we're we're shortening that um, to make it much much more user friendly. Uh, I mean that's one thing that uh, we've learned in our office in terms of um, these documents have to be really user friendly really easy to read um, and um, you know in terms of case studies uh, and, and pull out sheets and things like that so um, so I, I hope that um, uh, that we're doing something that's going to be used and we seem to be getting a lot of it like we're getting demand for our products before we can release them which is which is really nice but it's really frustrating because you, you can't release them yet but I'm hoping that they're useful that I have for you is 
of are you reaching out to the ethnic communities? Because I know that in areas such as, as elder abuse, uh, the, there is a major initiative to get the documents um, translated into other languages because we know that some of those people who are isolated, who are vulnerable, and who might not otherwise know to look for the heat warnings and the possibilities. So yeah. I think that's, that's an area that uh, certainly could, could be explored. Okay. Well, um, I, I think we are. Um, and what I'm going to, I'm going to try and answer the question and Anastasia is going to correct me uh, if, if I'm wrong. She's actually been, uh, she's uh, been leading the development of the, um, well, she led the development of the brochures and of the, uh, the communications toolkit. Um, we did have uh, quite a bit of interest in getting um, some of the brochures translated. Um, and uh, for us, it's a, a bit of an issue in terms of, uh, you know, the funding. Um, but I think if um, – uh, I know that um, Toronto, uh, some communities actually have these available in many, many languages, which responds to the need that you're talking about uh, in terms of raising awareness uh, among some of these, uh, these groups. Is there anything you, you might want to add to that, Anastasia, in terms of getting out to uh, some of the people, mostly through our brochures in terms of uh, that? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Anastasia. That uh, been referred to on a number of occasions, and we've definitely had that kind of requests coming to us uh, to try to accommodate the language needs, whether it is of um, you know newcomers to Canada or it is uh, already existing residencies that uh, use different uh, languages. We've currently left it in the court of uh, the ball. We've left it in the court of the authorities that are going to be disseminating the information. We're currently going to be providing it in English and French um, as far as our budget is concerned, but we are definitely taking a note of uh, any requests that do come in and uh, with the hope that eventually we'll be able to translate it. And uh, one thing I would like to um, for you to keep in mind is that the documents that we've currently developed, the brochures I think that Peter uh, put up, and I actually have a copy here. Um, this is the, sorry, my, my stuff is sliding down, but this is the um, one for children, um, well, I guess it's for parents to keep their children uh, cool. Um, th these products have not yet been tested. The messaging in there are scientifically accurate. We've tried to do the best we can from the focus uh, group and uh, uh, community partners that uh, have contributed to the work. But what we are hoping is that we're going to be getting feedback on these documents uh, as they actually become available and get used uh, more broadly and uh, with, the, with the intention to modify them and make them as, uh, more user-friendly, more tailored uh, if needed. And uh, eventually those are the ones that we're likely to um, translate to the languages that we get, we're getting requests uh, for. And... Um, like I said, uh, we have, uh, Peter mentioned that we've uh, lost uh, our package uh, on this way from Ottawa to here. Uh, but we do have some of them available in the, at the back table. So if you um, want to have a look, we're definitely taking any feedback and advice that you have to offer. And uh, I think uh, Peter's information is up there for more information. And uh, my information will be available tomorrow as I'm doing a presentation in the afternoon. And I guess another question is, uh, in addition to the brochures, how are you getting the message out? Are you, you um, working with the national or provincial seniors associations? Oh. Um, a lot of the actual communication to the public uh, occurs at the uh, local level. So we're really trying to facilitate that by... Um, uh, developing some of the science-based messages and then having them take that and sort of tailor that as they need to. And what we're finding is uh, a lot of them are just taking the, the materials. Um, you know, we I think we printed something like 2,000 uh, of the brochures and um, uh, we're in a lot of trouble because we've had requests for 35,000 or something of them, which is which is great. Uh, but uh, um, so so they're they're really the the um, the, the ones that are uh, putting this forward. We are actually, um, uh, in terms of the public health officials and, and trying to get out to the public health officials, one thing that we found was really quite successful is 
uh, we hold uh, webinars, uh, extreme heat and health community sharing network webinars. And we kind of, I kind of expected that we'd get like 20 communities that would tune into these. And, and they're about sharing information uh, about how, you know, extreme heat and uh, health uh, impacts and best practices for adaptation. And we get 70 to, uh, to 100 uh, communities um, in Canada that, uh, that tune into these. In the U.S., uh, the American Public Health Association does this for climate change and health. They get 800 participants in their web webinars. So these are really becoming uh, quite, uh, I think, useful mechanisms to to uh, increase awareness. Now, in terms of uh, uh, seniors, we haven't um, uh, yet done that, but we're actually um, uh, in the dissemination mode of our materials. So we will uh, certainly take that on board, Glory, in terms of uh, a great idea. that it's very difficult. We have a lot of information, but it's difficult to change behavior. And one of the areas... One of the areas that the Pacific Institute of Climate Solutions is addressing is social mobilization that we have identified as a major uh, uh, area that we need to, to, to do research, uh, looking for solutions and how to engage people in how, uh, on, climate solution, on climate issues. So I just want to let everybody know that we are funding some research on this area on social mobilization, and there are other areas that the Pacific Institute for Climate Solution is working on, at low carbon economy emissions, resilient uh, communities, and you can, uh, if you want to learn more about all these projects that we are just, uh, just f uh, start funding this year, there is uh, information on the back of the room. Yeah, that, that's that's really really great to know. Actually, I mean, it's it's one area that, uh, within what we've been doing with our uh, heat alert response best practices guide, um, uh, I don't I don't know that we have enough on social mobilization, and so I'll, I'll certainly be in contact about some of the stuff that you're doing. It's great. Okay. Well, and uh, uh, I guess another possibility and an area I would encourage you to think about is to dialogue with the gerontological. Mm -hmm. Society, uh, the Canadian, and then the the both the gerontological and the geriatrics, okay. because those are two separate societies. And I know that um, Kathy has has held sessions at the Gerontological Society of okay. America meetings. Okay. Yes, okay. and and the the folks in our office that are developing the healthcare worker guidelines, they may have actually, and uh, I'll certainly bring that back uh, to them because I know that would be uh, particularly. Uh, of interest for them. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Nicolis from Greece. Um, I, perhaps you didn't uh, talk a lot, a little bit more about the prevention mm. of, uh, of how, how to prepare the community, the aging community, since uh, we know that uh, this uh, phenomena, uh, phenomena uh, happen yeah. and will happen. Yeah. So perhaps uh, a little bit more prevention in order to be ready and not uh, in a sudden? Sure. Um, well, I, well and I, I think the social mobilization really speaks to that in terms of um, uh, you know making the social bonds in the community, the, the sort of social capital uh, stronger is, is one uh, key area of prevention um, and, and something that uh, really needs to be pursued. One, one specific area that we are looking at with the extreme heat uh, area is the whole issue of um, addressing the urban heat island. So it's, it's not waiting for the heat to come and then have to respond uh, to the, the hot temperatures, but to you know, actually prevent the, um, the communities from heating up in the first place, in a sense, because of all the pavement and such. And so one of the sections we have on our uh, best practices guide for communities in developing these heat alert and response systems is on reducing the urban heat island. It's the preventative approach. Um, so from the heat perspective, I think we, we, we are uh, uh, trying to address that a little bit. And there's, there's a lot of um, uh, interest in the public health community. That's one of the first things they say is, you know, how do we stop the heat first from, uh, from getting to us? So, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'm conscious of the time, and on, uh, I would like to uh, have you join with me in thanking Peter for an excellent presentation. <laughs> <laughs>